tracing phenotypic evolution for billions of years. Okay. So, hi, my name is Herman Plata. I'm a postdoc at Columbia University, and uh, compared to what we just heard, I'm going to talk about basically evolution of phenotypes, but over very, very long periods of time. And so the reason I'm, I'm interested in, in phenotypic evolution is because although basically morphological variation of plants and animals was what inspired like theory of natural selection and evolutionary thinking in general, uh, like uh, we seem to know more about how molecules evolve than, than we do about how, like the organisms that, that carry those molecules. So for example, we have very good, like various models that describe how mutations accumulate and how they, they occur. And for instance, we know like highly expressed proteins evolve slowly and we don't have these kinds of, of relationships of observations for, for phenotypes. So, so we could start uh, like studying phenotypes, for example, with Darwin's finches. We could start like measuring the beaks of the finches and, and try to see like when they change and, and how fast are they changing. But we couldn't get too far back in time. And, and the, the, the main reason, like, like if you try to solve this problem for animals, is that it's, it's very hard to find uh, like a organism level phenotype that you can compare like across the world. So, so how do you compare like a worm to a mouse to a fly and like measure the same phenotype and compare it across all, all of them. But uh, for bacteria, we, we have very different situations. So what I'm showing you here is like five different species. They live in different environments, like some of them in the soil, some of them live in the guts, some of them causes diseases. So they're like very different, but if you look at them in the microscope, they look very similar to one another. And what this says is that like many of the relevant phenotypes for bacteria are, are not morphological, but they're like phy physiological or biochemical. So for example, like what, what types of nutrients can one bacteria extract from the environment to grow? That's like something that's very important for every bacteria. So every bacteria needs to, to, to basically compete wh where it lives in order to, to, to persist. So basically what I'm going to do is going to do a comparison across different bacteria of, of basically some of these biochemical phenotypes. Uh, so I'm going to be using a basically metabolic network models to do this analysis. And as we saw on Wednesday, basically a metabolic network collection of reactions that, that tells you how basically different nutrients are transformed into new cells, basically by synthesizing these biomass components. And we also saw that there are certain methods, so for example, flux balance analysis, which use basically this uh, collection of reactions, the stoichiometry, basically bio information about biomass composition and like, simple assumptions so such as steady state and allow us to make like some predictions about the behavior of this network. So for example, we can predict if this production of biomass is possible under different growth conditions. So we can change those nutrients that go into the cell. And we can predict if, if we make genetic perturbations, so you delete a gene or you delete sets of genes, can you still grow, produce biomass? So it's like a very nice technique based on, on very simple assumptions. Mm. So what we did is basically we collected uh, metabolic network models for 322 bacterial strains, uh, which are somehow represented here in this phylogenetic tree. So, so it's based on the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And the colors in the tree basically represent different classes of bacteria. So it's like very broad taxonomic uh, groups. And what I was just want to show here is that we're looking at, at very diverse bacteria. So we have like 100 families, 254 species. So we even have like several strains for the same species. And because the species have had their genome sequenced, uh, we are using basically a computational pipeline developed by Chris Henry that allows to basically use those annotations to build those metabolic network models. And we are going to use those models to predict phenotypes. So the, the first thing we're going to look at is basically this ability to use different nutrients for growth. So I'm showing you here like, like five different molecules that may be in the environment. In reality, we test hundreds of these molecules. The idea is that we can, for each species, predict if, if each of these molecules can allow the, the, the bug to, to grow. And, and this can be represented basically as a binary profile, so, so we call it like a phenotypic vector. And we can calculate these vectors for, for like all 322 bacteria. And so we can compare those vectors and see how similar they are. And for this, we can use like any distance measure. But we are using a simple one, which is Jacquard similarity, which is just basically like, like a way to measure the overlap between those two vectors. So, so basically these two species, they share two carbon sources out of four carbon sources that they can use in total. So basically Jacquard similarity or similarity of the phenotypic profiles is 0.5. 
So what we did is basically compare those similarities to the divergence time between the species. And I'm gonna show you basically the main result. So in this figure here we have, like on the x-axis, we have the genetic distance between bacteria. So this is, again, based on alignments of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Genetic distance basically indicates basically the number of substitutions per site. Like closed bacteria are here, the diverse bacteria are here. On the y-axis we have this, this phenotypic overlap. And in the middle, because we have like 322 bacteria, if we do all pairwise comparison between those bacteria, we have approximately 50,000 comparisons. So I'm just showing like point density so, so that the graph is not like overwhelmed. So blue means like, like low number of pairs fall in those places. And yellow and red means that the most density of, of all pairwise comparison fall in those places. And the red line is just like a sliding window moving average for, for those points. So what you see, uh, and again, like, like basically, this genetic distance is like somehow proportional to the, to the time of divergence between the species. So, so we cover like from zero to 3.5 billion years. And I mean, what you see in general is that there is like a decay of the similarity as, as you look like back in time. And, but like beyond that, I want you to focus on like, like very, like some specific points in this figure. So for example, when you look at very close bacteria, like a strains within the same species, you don't see the phenotypic similarity going to one. So actually you see that the like average similarity is like around 0.7 for these very close bacteria. So this means that, that there is this like, very quick divergence, like almost like within a, a million years, you have lost like 30% of the phenotypes that you had, which are like from common ancestor. And then you have like this, this much slower divergence that kind of starts to saturate after a certain point. Basically you have like on very long time scales, you have like about in this, in this figure, 25% conservation of the phenotype profiles. And, and like two interesting things about this is that this, this similarity does not go to zero, so you don't have completely different bacteria. Other than that, if you, if you calculate what's the expectation, like similarity you expect by, by randomly sampling carbon sources, it's still higher than that. So there are still like some common carbon sources that share by all bacteria. And another thing that you can look in this figure is that there's like, like a lot of like a large variance around, around that mean. What it, what it basically allows or what this, this enables basically the, the fact that you can have bacteria that they were long time ago, like half a billion years ago, and they could still be more similar phenotypically than bacteria that have just diversed. So like having this result, we wanted to come up with some model that would describe this behavior. And we, we found that there's actually like very simple exponential model that fits quite nicely like this, this average behavior. So, so in this equation, Y represents the phenotypic similarity between two pairs of bacteria. A is related to this long-term conservation of phenotypic pro uh, properties. And B is related to this fast initial divergence. And then you have like a time, which is like a genetic distance. And then you have this, this constant here, which indicates how fast you go from like the initial conservation to the, to the, to the final conservation. Basically, like one interpretation of this exponential model is that basically you have like a constant proportion of um, phenotypic properties changing per unit time. So this is like a nice model to represent this behavior. But of course, this is all based on models and models are not perfect. So we wanted to see if we could somehow validate this experimentally. And to do that, we use like this uh, phenotypic microarray technology called BioLock. So in this case, you have like a, like a plate and you have different nutrient sources, can be carbon sources in each of the wells. And there's like a molecule that change color if bacteria is actively growing or, or respiring in those, in those wells. So this can be automated. So you basically get phenotypic profiles directly from, from putting the bacteria there. And we collected this data for 40 species, which is an independent set of species from, from what we did the simulations on. Uh, but they also come like from different uh, branches of the phylogenetic tree. So we also cover like these this wide uh, evolutionary distances. And like the result for the experimental data looks like this. So again, you have genetic distance and similarity of phenotypic profiles. And you see like, like quite a spread of the points and you see this, yeah, this is more conserved here than here. But actually when you calculate the average behavior for these points, so, so we have like 40 species, so we have like all pairwise comparison is, is less points. When you look at the, at the average, like as a function of genetic distance, you see that, that it's quite similar behavior to what we observed when we fitted this model to the predictions. And indeed, if you try to compare this, these two curves, they, they, they fall quite closely. So it's just kind of like a remarkable look. And not only can we capture the, the average behavior, but if we look at the, at the variability of the data, 
we, we actually uh, like measure this using coefficient of variation as a function of genetic distance that you see like, like overlap. So it's not like the predictions uh, are like very narrow and the experimental data is very broad. So like variability is also consistent. So yeah, so, so that's like the first part. Like second part, we wanted to also look at if, if different phenotypes follow, uh, follow the same rules or they, they, they're all in the, the, the same way. And, and one phenotype that's interesting and that these models are actually like recently be able to predict is, is gene essentiality. So we wanted to ask if essentiality of genes is conserved between different species of bacteria. And we did the same analysis, so, so we get like phenotypic vectors that indicate if a gene is essential or not, and then we align this vector between bacteria using like orthologous genes. And we get a, a figure that looks like this, so, so it's the same kind of figure. But in this case, although you see the same like fast divergence of the gene essentiality profiles between bacteria, you see that this long-term conservation of the essentiality is actually much higher than we observed for the carbon sources. So, so like this is this 0.5 and before it was like 0.25. So the, the red line is basically the exponential fit, which is still like a good model to describe this behavior. Now, again, we, we would like to validate this experimentally. And to do this, uh, we collected basically studies, like, like individual papers that were done where people basically tried to do all single gene knockouts in different species of bacteria. And then we, we were able to find about 20 different species where this had been done. And then we aligned basically those results for the metabolic genes uh, by the orthology between the genes. So, so I'm going to show you just the pairs for those 20 species of which we, on which we find uh, that information. And what's basically nice about what we observe is that like most of the comparisons for this experimentally determined essentiality data fall in the like high density regions of our, of our predictions. So, so again, and if you look at the, at the average or, or the fit for the, this experimental data, like, like in general, you can like observe the same behavior that we're seeing with our model, like this, this quick divergence and then basically saturation like at a, at a high conservation level. And you can interpret this basically in a like, simple way, like if you take any two random bacteria it's likely that more than half of the genes that are essential in one species will also be essential in another one, even after 3.5 billion years of evolution. Now, second phenotype that's interesting and has been measure, uh, mentioned in this conference is, is like evolution of synthetic lethal interactions between gene pairs. And again, like, if you want to validate this, right? So, so we saw how hard it is to get this genetic interaction map. So you not, not only have to do the single gene deletions, but you have to do like the millions of double gene deletions and not only one species, but multiple species to see how this evolves, right? So it's very complicated, but like, like using models, you can do it like quite easily. At least it could give you a, an idea of what, what's, what's going on. So we did this, this, this analysis. We deleted all, all pairs of genes in, in all of 300 bacteria. And we observed like, like this behavior. So in general, what you observe is that the conservation of this synthetic lethality between pairs of genes is, is, is lower than you observe for the other phenotypes. So it's about only 30% on close genetic distances. And then as you diverge, like, like you take a uh, longer uh, evolutionary time, the, the, the conservation drops like below 5% on average. So here I'd like to show you like, like bacterial assays where they did this, but, but that data doesn't exist and I think we only could find data for eukaryotes. So, so people have tried to, to ask this question, for example, comparing budding yeast, fission yeast, uh, C. elegans, like using AI. And actually, when you look at the data that, like, like the conservation levels, like reported in those studies, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I don't know if, <laughs> because they, they follow like exactly like on the, on the line we, we predict. So, so, I mean, and these are, these are eukaryotes and, and of course, like I match them based on the like evolutionary time, like just, just, but then, I mean, it still suggests that basically these, these genetic conservations may, the genetic interaction may be much less conserved than, than like for example, essentiality, which I think makes sense because there are more ways to perturb genetic interactions between, between two genes. So, yeah, so, so like in general, like across this, this basically three experiments, what we see is basically this, this continuity over very long periods of time of, of, of this evolutionary process, like, like on average behavior. So I wanna like conclude like, like comparing basically to this uh, hypothesis of this idea that was like uh, proposed like half a century ago, Soccer and Pauling, who basically uh, they look at the, the basically a number of substitutions accumulated between two proteins resulted to be like a 
directly proportional to the amount of time that has passed since those uh, species carrying those proteins uh, diverged. So basically this, this is called the molecular clock hypothesis and it's, uh, I mean, this, this inspired basically the neutral theory of molecular evolution and I mean, it's been quite useful, so for example, to date various evolutionary events. And I mean, we'd like to, I mean, if, if we want to think of phenotypes, we actually find that there are like some regularities, although bacteria may be like quite plastic in, in their genomes and they can adapt quite rapidly, lose and gain genes. Like if you look on average across a wide variety of bacteria, you do see sort of a, a, a regularity. So what's shown here, like over a period of one billion years, you kind of see this linear dependency in the number of phenotypic differences that accumulated and the, and the divergence time. So yeah, with that, I'd like to thank be my group at Columbia for discussion, my advisor, advisor Dennis Vetkop, Chris Henry helped us like build the metabolic models that we use for this project, and Barry Wagner gave us uh, the, the phenotypic microarray data that allowed us to validate some of these observations. So, thank you very much. So I'll actually start out. So the conserved genes, but the central genes and carbon, is it like the same set? You know, that, or if you look at like all, like you understand what I'm saying, like if you look at all the essential potential genes, with the essentials is always the same, like 20% or 30% that are shared with everybody, or is it different sets that are shared? Uh, in general, it's different. So, so in, I mean, if you, if you calculate, I mean, you have a matrix where you have yeah. like all carbon sources or all essential yeah. genes versus all species. You, you have a distribution and you have some things that are more likely to be shared among more species. But there is no, I mean, There's no like core, core. For, for example, there is no single carbon source that either in the predictions or the experimental data set was used by all species. I mean, you, you have like distribution of frequencies, but, but apparently like it's not unique uh, core, let's say, of... of and, and then when you see things diverge, do you look at the trajectory of divergence? Does that have any type of pattern? Like you lose a set of things that are all related to like, you know, one carbon source or one process, et cetera? Or is that... Yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, like, for that, you, you have to do, like, like a similar analysis to what Pedro did, so you have to consider, basically, like, evolutionary tree and try to map, yeah. like, like, the order of events. In general, you can calculate evolutionary rates for different, like, reactions and things like this, and we observe, basically, kind of what, like, like, transporters and, like, like, things that are, like, not central metabolism yeah. tend to change first, mm -hmm. but then it's, it's not, it's not, uh, I mean, like, like, sometimes, uh, like, the rates, do not, do not directly match like central processes. Some, some things that may be evolving fast in one branch is evolving slowly in another one, so. So um, the Jacquard measure is fairly sensitive to the absolute number of phenotypes you have. If you look at different measures of similarity, do you see the same trends? Yeah, so, so well, in, in, in general, yes. So, so we tried, uh, for example, like, like uh, just uh, Euclidean distance between these vectors and these kinds of things. So, so of course, that then it's not normalized to one, but, but you still see basically this, this, this exponential decay. We also tried, for example, like results I showed you are for like 62 carbon sources, like the one we tested in the experiments, but we tried to do like, like a 400, like every possible carbon source that we had in the models. And, and there the conservation was still, I mean, like, like, like the, the, the profile looked quite similar in, in that case. So. Hi, nice talk. Um, I was wondering, you know, on these evolutionary timescales, I imagine horizontal gene transfer could confound some of the phylogenetic similarity. I was wondering if you've thought about controlling for that anyway? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, if you mean that the, like, x-axis is based on, like, 16 ribosomal RNA, I mean, that, in general, is not a gene that's that often, I mean, it, it can be horizontally transferred, but it's not that often horizontally transferred, and when it's transferred, it's transfer to something that's close. So in reality, at those time scales, I think th this would average out. But the other thing is that, I mean, you saw this, this huge jump, like on the very close species, and I think that's basically the main effect of like horizontal gene transfer recombination. So basically you have this pangenome and the species tries all possible like combinations of genes like within that pangenome. But when you see this slow decay, basically the, the divergence between the cores of the species and there are like, like horizontal transfer of like this recombination is, is less, I mean, has less of an effect. So, so I mean, it could be causing like the variance, but I think the, the, the main trend is, is, is not really affect, well, 
the common average. I mean, so that's why we look at the very large number of species. Excellent. Let's think again. Thank you.